I'm so excited to welcome you to the Writer Center's virtual craft chat series where we talk with writers a little less about what they wrote and a little more about how they wrote it. My name is Emily Holland and I'm thrilled to have Ruben Quesada with us tonight to celebrate his new collection, Brutal Companion. Ruben, thank you so much for being here with us. Thanks so much for having me. I've been looking forward to this. I've been watching your your <laughs> previous episodes and I hope I hope I I hope I can do you justice cuz <laughs> There have been some good chats you've had. I'm sure this one will not disappoint. I'm super excited. Um, and congratulations on publication week. It's always a busy time. So we're so excited to have you here. Um, would you mind reading a poem or two or three from the book to start us off? Sure, I'd love to. Um, oh, boy. Uh, you know, I'll start with the opening poem. I think it really... Um, kind of captures the different uh, ideas that are in the book, um, ideas of loss, ideas of um, uh, grief and memory and um, and also companionship. So uh, this is uh, this is terminology. My mother is going to die. Her ashes will be sown into the ocean stitched onto passing angelfish. I think of what she'll look like when she dies, as if permanently sleeping, slivers of lids closing her off from me, like a torrent swelling against the coverture of bone, embracing my lungs. My breath fails to escape the natural order of things. Dawn, dusk, unequivocal heartbreak. Her silhouette flashes and I think of you next to me every morning. It'll be years from now, but you too will appear to be asleep when I discover you, as if cast from porcelain or copper, like Hermes waiting at a museum in Rome, from dust, from a fragment of rib, your nearly opened lips, Weaving breath in the tongue of light, your smooth figure at my side. And I will know then, Aristophanes was right about two halves of man faring through life in search of each other. Thank you. Did you want to read another one or, or just give us the one? <laughs> Uh, I'd love to. Thank I'd you. love to. Uh, so this, I, I'll read this one. Um, uh, gosh, I want to read something I've never read, actually. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I like this one here. I'll read this one. This is uh, called Connoisseurs. Um, uh, Keecha Kuypers actually published this many, many years ago in Southern Humanities Review. And um, I remember I wrote this when I was in uh, I was at a residency at a um, uh, in Red Lodge, um, Wyoming. Oh, no, Red Lodge, Montana. They're right next to each other. So I was in the middle of nowhere. And I all I had with me at the time was uh, a copy of the collected Marianne Moore. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I sat there. I sat in this studio uh, surrounded by um, they were mostly ceramicists, sculptures and um, and I, I was reading this, this this collection while watching all these artists create stuff out of, you know, out of clay. Uh, it was beautiful. Um, this is called Connoisseurs for Marianne Moore. Certain sunsets are purple lights kissing snow-covered rooftops or taking a sheet of paper to compose a love letter in purple-colored ink but I have something more desirable, a simple image of a child's wrist or far better moving pictures of the world I inhabit. I am transported to a parallel universe I have sought all my life. We stand in the street as a car idles and moths crowd into the light. It is late, steam from our mouths conjures smoke signals night feels colder than it is 
In a few days, snowfall is likely. The air fills with the smell of birch. Mirrors enlighten and delight. Humans are wondrous. Poets are wondrous. This I like best. Thank you. And thank you for um, reading a poem that you haven't read before. I love that. It's always uh, exciting to to hear something that feels new to you in some way as well. Um, all right. So before we dive into maybe the hard hitting questions, could you just tell us a little bit about who you are and maybe how you came to poetry? Sure. Um, well, I am a... Um uh uh i'm the child of an immigrant um my mother immigrated from costa rica uh and um i was born in los angeles uh and which is uh where i was raised until i um went uh uh, uh well uh, i was raised in la and um i have two older sisters but they're far older than i am and so it, I was raised kind of like an only child. And as a result, um, I had to figure out how to entertain myself sometimes. So uh, so I um, I turned to books and I wrote. I wrote a lot of letters. I wrote a lot of love letters as a kid, actually. And my mother would scold me because she was upset that if I, if I actually gave those love letters to children, their parents would get mad at me. And she would say <laughs> that I, I couldn't do that. So I did. So I... So I, so I never gave them out, but I kept writing letters and um, I kept writing. And eventually when I was, uh, when I was in high school, um, I developed a strong interest in math and science. And I was actually going to study physics. Uh, I'd applied to a number of schools and gotten into a number of physics programs. And then um, the Los Angeles times had a, a contest. It was an essay contest. It was called the, um, Cesar Chavez essay poetry contest. Mm -hmm. And uh, our, our uh, literature English teacher in high school <clears throat> offered us extra credit to submit to it. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I didn't know then that I had ADHD. And, you know, uh, with that comes a lot of procrastination and a lot of kind of delay because of the lack of focus. You know, we know that now. <clears throat> I know that now. But um, I didn't turn in, I didn't turn in the assignment. So mm -hmm. I didn't submit to that contest. But a friend of mine in class was curious if I, if I'd written anything. And I said, sure. And so I shared it with her. And I'd, I'd forgotten that I gave her a copy of it, right? Back, back then, everything was printed. Mm -hmm. uh, this was, this was pre early internet in the 90s. And um, <clears throat> I'd forgotten I'd gave her, I'd given her a copy of this, um, it was a long poem, essentially, like a monologue that I'd written about deforestation uh, of all things. I was I was really into that when I was when I was younger. I, you know, I was so um, she she ended up submitting what I'd written without me knowing. Mm -hmm. And weeks went by and I get a letter in the mail and uh, I won the contest. So I ended up winning the contest. Uh, I got the extra credit anyway. <laughs> and um, and I thought, wow, I can do something with my writing. I, I never imagined I could do anything with it. Uh, I didn't know anyone who was a creative writer. I didn't know anyone who had done any kind of creative writing. My high school didn't offer anything related to creative writing. You know, we just took literature courses. Um, there was no, there were creative outlets, but not writing. I, I you know, I, I was in the marching band. I played music. Uh but um, winning that contest really changed things for me. I, I, um, I then sought out um, ways that I could use that to, you know, maybe uh, make a living or, or go and study. So um, I, uh, I reapplied to schools. Uh, I ended up getting into the dramatic, um, dramatic arts, dramatic writing program at NYU. And um, <clears throat> And then I couldn't afford to go, so mm -hmm. uh, so I didn't. And um, I went to a community college, and eventually um, I went through and uh, got my bachelor's degree, and uh, got an MFA in creative writing. And uh, while I was in my MFA program, I took a number of literature courses, 
Um, and uh, I, I took a medieval confessional lit course. I remember that. I loved it. I absolutely loved it. Um, and I also took a Foucault seminar and mm -hmm. I loved that too. And so um, my, my uh, teachers uh, said, you know, you seem really uh, excited by literary theory uh, and criticism. So maybe you should go and study it further. Uh, and maybe you can find a program where you can study creative writing and do this. And uh, and at the time, there were a number of programs. There, there were probably about a score of programs or so. And uh, and I knew that I, I, I wanted to go to a program to get a PhD uh, that wouldn't cost me anything, <laughs> if possible. <laughs> um, and so I went to, I, I found one. I found mm -hmm. one that would pay everything, full ride, uh, and I went. Um, the only drawback was that it was in West Texas. It was in a in a very rural area. Uh, so I went to Texas Tech in Lubbock, Texas, mm. uh, and um, uh, I I I finished my PhD program there. Um, you know, I, oh my goodness, and uh, I got a tenure track job right out of right out of school, uh, and that's what brought me to Illinois, mm. and. Um, uh, you know, being in all these academic programs just really made me focus on on writing and literature and poetry. And uh, I mean, once I was once I was in that graduate, the first graduate program, I was hooked. I knew that mm -hmm. I didn't want to do anything else. So, um, uh, so so here I am. Um, mm -hmm. you know, I'm in Chicago now, uh, and I so I I've been in in Illinois since I finished grad school. And so that's, that was about 2012. Uh, so, um, so I've been teaching and just writing for, for about a decade now. And uh, it's been, it's been incredible. Um, it's been incredible. And that's all I do now. I mean, I'm an adjunct <laughs> here now in, in the city of Chicago. Mm. And, uh, and so um, being an adjunct gives me a lot of time uh, when, uh, when, when I don't get a teaching assignment. <laughs> And, uh, and so now I have, um, I have a lot of time to write and, mm. and I do a lot of it. So, um, so it, it's, it's good. It's good. It's yeah. good life. Yeah, no, that's an amazing journey from, you know, co a complete sort of life change. And then we see even in this collection, some of those places that you mentioned Lubbock and some of these cities, they appear as well. So it's all these things that now are kind of feeding your work in different ways too, which is great. Um, thank you for sharing that too. Um, so we have, I know you've been watching some of our older chats and we typically had, um, an opening question, but we just sort of decided to change it up. So, um, we're, we're going to ask a little bit of a different question than the one that we normally ask, but maybe we can throw that one in as well. Um, but this one I think, um, is really interesting in terms of thinking about craft of writing. Um, and so where does that kind of aspect of thinking about craft come into your process? Where or at what point do you find yourself most aware of that more kind of mechanical side of writing um, versus maybe that more kind of intuitive or um, kind of initial spark side of things? Yeah. Um... You know, uh, being a teacher and um, working as an editor has opened up um, or has made me much more aware of um, the nuances of language. Uh, over the last, I would say, maybe um, five or six years, I've been teaching a, a, a course on uh, prose poetry. And uh, you know, most people would just describe that as poetry that is not lineated, but but there's a little bit more to it. Uh, when I teach a prose poetry class, I'm really interested in sentences. So mm -hmm. a lot of the students that take my courses are um, not necessarily poets; they're just writers who want to write more uh, poetic sentences, as someone put it once. And uh, and so um, what I do is. Uh, you know, what I've done over the last several years is, is I've thought about how sentences are constructed, but more closely thinking about um, assonance and consonants, the sound of the sound of vowels and the sound of consonants and how 
uh, not only not only how they work within a sentence, but uh, even looking at a word and how the vowels and consonants of a single word might create uh, a sense of music or a rhythm uh, mm -hmm. in a sentence or in a line. And uh, and this is what I teach my students in in in, in class. And so when I'm when I'm revising primarily, when I write, uh, you know, it's, it's taken a long time for me to just be able to, to just put things down on the page without self editing as I mm -hmm. go. I think that's, I think that's pretty natural to do. But now when I go back to something, um, and I like to give my work a rest, right? Like I like to put something down on the paper and let it go. Uh, you know, I have, I have tons of notebooks where mm -hmm. I write and um, some of those notebooks I haven't reopened uh, in months, maybe even years. And mm -hmm. um, and I think having that distance allows me to have a little bit of emotional separation from whatever it was that motivated me to put it down first. Uh, but when I pick it back up, the revision process is really where I think about, um, I think about sound primarily. That's the first thing I think about. And the second thing I, I I consider when I'm revising, whether it's uh, whether it's choosing a different word because I want uh, a different sound to appear in that particular moment, and in those instances, of course, it has to be a synonym. Mm -hmm. uh, um, you know, I I like I like there to be a sense of clarity in the things that I write. It's not just it's not all lyrical. There's, there's a little bit of narratives. I like people to kind of follow along because I like to be able to follow along with, with what it is, you know, what's the idea that's being developed. So uh, I've, I, a thesaurus is my friend. Uh, there's a really great website that I, I always encourage people to, to go to called rhyme zone. Um, and it allows you to identify the word, right? You can look up a word, but it'll give you synonyms for that word and it'll organize it by syllables, by rhyming words. Uh, and so I can see the different, you know, so many different ways to say the same thing, mm -hmm. but also have a, have a, contr have control over the rhythm and sound or the pacing that the word makes. So I, you know, using these resources, I think are incredibly helpful. Um, you know, I, there's a, there's this um, series um, on YouTube called Poems You Need, and uh, it's run by um, Kelly Russell Agadon and Melissa Studdard. And they, they, they do a, a reading of one of my poems, and there was something uh, that, that was said uh, about my use of diction in, mm -hmm. that, in that series that I think is, is quite accurate. Uh, you know, I like to use diction, varied diction, um, for to name something that is quite mundane. Mm -hmm. uh, and so when you look up a word, I might use like you know, the, the number two or number three of the definition of that word. Um, and uh, and I think that's I think that's what's so rewarding about being a poet is your tools are, are language or are, are the diction and syntax. And so why not use words to to their full effect? Um, you know, one thing I, I, I've always loved about poetry or about literature generally is how it can teach me new words. It can teach me new mm -hmm. ways to say something. And so when I'm revising, uh, I'm looking for that. I, I want to be able to do that. I want to, not only do I want to teach my readers new ways to see things or, or say things, but, uh, I'm learning in the process as well. Yeah, I love that. And I love that you were talking about that sort of attentiveness to the sentence. I um I also am sort of in the the adjunct sphere in terms of um creative writing and it's always interesting the the writers who uh, are in classes and want to be writers but don't engage with poetry. I'm like, wait, <laughs> you need to be, you need to be focusing on these things, these small parts of the sentence that can really kind of make even your prose sing on the page. So I love that. Um, and you brought up musicality and you mentioned sort of in your um, kind of introduction um, that you played music and you were in marching band and things like that. So I wondered if you could talk about where that attention to the music of the poem really comes in for you. Um, how important is that to you in that writing process, in the 
um, kind of process of putting the collection together too. I mean, I loved sort of going through and um, even pausing. And I was like, wait, this line is going to feel so good. If I read it out loud, you can really kind of feel the the weight of the words. And we heard um, some of those rhythms and sounds when you were reading as well. So yeah, could you just talk about your um, kind of attention to music and where that comes in for you? Yeah, um, I think as I get older, uh, it the attention to music in in my poetry becomes much more uh, necessary. I feel mm -hmm. I feel a, a greater desire for it to be noticeable. Uh, and I I don't like I'm not a, necessarily a fan of of sing songy or or end rhymes. Uh, you know, consistent end rhymes. I like it when there's an internal rhyme, or I like mm -hmm. it when there's an occasional rhyme. And um, I I think it's just so surprising when you when you discover that in a poem. And, uh, you know, my my growing interest in that um, started after I uh, I started reading uh, the late work. Uh, and by that, I mean, like the, the work that was written toward the end of of, of their life of uh, Richard Wilbur. Mm -hmm. So the late poems of Richard Wilbur are um, they look like nursery rhymes and there are even illustrations uh, that he made. So um and he, and he might have called it like songs for children, something something to that extent. But it was that attention to music that just really struck me. And I thought, wow, this is this is really enjoyable. Also, if you ever hear a recording of Frederick Seidel reading mm -hmm. anything, I mean, there's just so much music in his work. Um, so, uh, I I I I think what draws me to that rhythm and sound has a lot to do with not just seeing it done well in other people's work, but uh, you know, the last few years I was also teaching a, a course on traditional poetic forms, mm -hmm. uh, which really, which, which inspired me to put together the folio for poet lore. And it was, it was that, that uh, time that I spent with, with my students and, you know, getting, teaching someone to, write in a uh, traditional form is 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 not easy uh you know everyone has it has a different ear for the sound of language um you know there's a really there's a book that robert pinsky wrote called the sound of poetry and in the opening of it he talks about how um we should not be teaching people how to write in meter I'm I'm obviously I you know I'm 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 paraphrasing, but he says that it shouldn't be taught because it's inherent in learning the English language, and it might be. But I I grew up speaking Spanish, and so mm -hmm. when I learned the English language, you know it 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 came through with a filter this this filter that I just I had because of the Spanish language. So where I place emphasis on certain words is not going to be the place where someone who only grows up with the English language. Mm -hmm is is going to going to emphasize a particular word so um so it was always very difficult for me to to really identify that those sounds when it came to to scansion or or you know prosody I just I struggled I struggled so much and it it wasn't until you know maybe the last decade or so that I I I spent much more time just thinking about phonemes and thinking about like the mm -hmm. small units of language, right? Within a word, like syllables, even if, if that's, that's easier for you. Like I, I started with syllables, syllabic, syllabic um, poetry, which was huge in, you know, in, in, in France. Um, and, uh, and just being able to think about um, how to manipulate language using syllables was a was a good way for me to become much more interested in in um, meter and mm -hmm. uh, accentual verse, um, and so uh, you know it's a, it's a number of things: teaching, seeing it done well, listening to other poets do it. Um, I wanted that to be part of my work as well. I wanted mm -hmm. I wanted to charm my reader, my listener, and. Um, uh, you know, it's um, like I mentioned, Frederick Seidel. I think another poet that does that really well is Ari Banias. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there there are some poets that can just they're just like they're just magic the way they they the way they express their work. And uh, 
I, I knew that I wanted to do that with my work whenever possible. And, and it's not always possible, you know, um, uh, but, but my attention to music and language, um, I think it just comes from wanting to find a way to just charm my reader. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I like to tell people my favorite letter is the letter L. Like, I just love the way it sounds. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I think everyone should have favorite letters. Um, so, uh, yeah, so that's, I, I don't know. I think that's that's where my, my interest in music um, in, in poetry comes from, is just from, from seeing it done well. And I want to do mm -hmm. it too. Yeah, I love that sort of inspiration, right? We're always giving that advice, read more, and that's sort of how we learn. But it's sort of that attention to another poet's language. And um, Seidel is one that I always go back to as well. I used to um, have his poem Flame memorized. It's not quite in my memory anymore, but that one in particular, um, I remember the bees and that kind of humming energy and that language. So um, kind of connected there too. But yeah, I love what you were saying about the difficulty that can come with prosody and learning meter as well. Um, something I struggle with too, and kind of finding your own entry points to be able to incorporate that into your process. Um, however, that may come is really important. I'm going to jump into the chat because we have a couple questions. Um, the first one, um, what time of day do you most enjoy writing or when are you most productive? <laughs> oh my goodness um uh, i'm a night owl uh so um uh i typically get to my desk around this time and uh i will work i have a i, I like to have a timer I, I keep a timer at my desk uh and so i i get up every 30 to 40 minutes because otherwise i'll just sit here all night um but i get to my desk around this time and i work i work until maybe about three or four a.m. Oh my and goodness. <laughs> uh, it's just quiet. It's just, mm -hmm. you know, I love, I, I, I'm, my, uh, my office faces um, the backyard. And if, if you know Chicago, there are alleys everywhere. And so I, I, I can see the alley from here. And, you know, it's just, it's just quiet. And I see there's another building. The house is quiet. My dog's asleep. Uh, <laughs> And, uh, and so there's, there's nothing to bother or distract me, you know, during the day, uh, I get up at around noon, maybe 11. Um, and, uh, there, there are, you know, things to do around the house, take care of the dog. There's just, there's life to live. And, uh, and so I like to take advantage of, of the, of the late night hours because, because the world, uh, isn't available to distract me. Mm. Mm. Yeah, that's a that's key, right? These distractions that always find their way into our process in some form or another. Um, I say that my cat just jumped from somewhere, so <laughs> always a distraction around. Um, another question about the process of publication: um, How did you find the right publisher for your first book and the other projects you've worked on this book? And I know you've done an anthology as well. Um, <clears throat> this book was, uh, you know, this, this book, um, uh, I had this, I sent this book out to contests, mm -hmm. you know, I did, I didn't, um, I've met, I've met many editors or people from different presses over the years, but, um, uh, but I, sub I submitted this to a contest. I, I wanted, I wanted it to be picked up somewhere. Um, I wasn't sure where, um, you know, there were, there were, um, two open calls that I did Scribner uh did mm. this one open call where they only took like 200 people did you get into that one I know it was I, like <laughs> I did get into it <laughs> I did and I got a rejection uh and so um that's fine it happens um and then the other one was cup uh copper copper canyon mm. and um my manuscript sat in progress uh in submittable for copper canyon for two years mm. and um I know. Um, <laughs> and um, <clears throat> excuse me. So um, when I when the book was picked up by <clears throat> by Barrow Street, I withdrew it from Copper Canyon. It was still just kind of sitting there. Um, 
it had it you know the book placed or was was recognized by by other presses that I'd submitted to so um I knew I wanted it to go to um to a number a couple of presses you know I submitted it to maybe a handful of places Copper Canyon Scribner uh Barrow Street Tupelo um <clears throat> word works uh, a lot of and a lot of these contests I learned about at AWP through the mm -hmm. um you know just kind of wandering around the book fair um a lot of them I I found through poets and writers um <clears throat> my my other books like the anthology which is uh you know an, an anthology of essays um that are based on uh you know the the idea for that came about from from this book actually um this is uh this is a, a book Mm -hmm. um called 20th century american poetics uh by dana joya um uh david mason and meg shirky and um and it's a collection of essays by poets uh from the 20th century and um there are only three latinx people in that mm -hmm. <clears throat> and uh and i thought why isn't there a book like this just by latinx people and there and so i made one mm -hmm. and uh and so i wrote a proposal sent it out to um, presses that I thought would be interested in something like that, like a book of a book of essays about poetry. You know, and there, there, uh, there are a number of presses that would have taken it. Um, but I knew people at Arizona, University of Arizona, uh, at University of New Mexico and um, University of Georgia. Uh, so I talked to them before I even like, you know, I sent them a message said like, this is I'm, I'm planning on on writing this proposal, you know, is this something you think your press would consider? And, um, and they all said, yeah, just, you know, submit, submit your proposal, give us some samples. You know, I, I had a, a sample introduction. I had a, a list of people who had agreed to submit something. So I had all of that first, right? Like I had all the, like I had all these receipts to say, all these people are on board. Now I just need you to publish it. And, um, and so, um, University of New Mexico got back to me fairly quickly and um, <clears throat> uh, they they won me over. They were just really easy to work with, really accessible. <clears throat> and um, they gave me a lot of control over putting it together, the cover, um, you know, and, and that's good. Uh, I, I think it's good to have to retain as much control of a project as, as possible. And so mm -hmm. I, I had that with them. Um, I don't know if I I don't I I don't know if um, if the other presses would have done that, but but I loved I loved working with New Mex uh, University of New Mexico, and um, uh, and so it was a right right fit for that. Uh, you know, I've talked with them about putting together another anthology. I'm I'm I really would love to put together an anthology of prose poetry. Mm -hmm. Um, there are only I think maybe a handful of those, um, and there's only one critical book of prose poetry. Uh, and that's and it's and that's edited by two professors from Australia. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, prose poetry is big down there. So um, and it's published by Princeton. Princeton University mm -hmm. Press published a critical book on prose poetry, which is pretty cool. And it just came out like two or three years ago. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, so you know, in thinking about like where do I go, where do I want to, where do I want to, um, where would I want this to go next? Uh, you know, I've talked to University of New Mexico about it and they seem interested. Um, I don't know anyone at Princeton University Press, <laughs> but, you know, given that they've published this critical book, maybe they'd be into a maybe they'd be into an anthology. Um, I, I don't think I, I, don't, I only know their publicist, <laughs> so I don't know. I don't know anybody else there. So we'll see. We'll see where if that anyone goes. here does <laughs> drop a line so we can get this book in the works. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. No, and it's great to hear about those different avenues, right, for different types of projects. And, you know, the poetry submission landscape is always changing with new contests, different contests and um, windows that if you're quick enough, you can <laughs> you can get your submission into. Um yeah. But it's great, and we're super excited that Brutal Companion is out um, with Barrow Street because it's a wonderful collection. Um, maybe we'll turn back to the collection a little bit. Um, I have so many things to ask you about, but I was really drawn to thinking about form, um, especially with your sort of considerations already about traditional poetic forms. Um, there's a couple of 
kind of traditional forms in the space of the book, sonnet, things like that. Um, and then you also engage with ekphrastic in different ways too. Um, so I wondered if we could just talk a little bit about your interest in form, your relationship to form, um, and then maybe how the ekphrastic mode and the use of art artists, there's some different sort of textured references, some of which we heard in the poems you read too, uh, mythology, biblical figures, things like that. So um, lots of things to talk about. But yeah, maybe we'll just start with form and then we can expand from there. Sure. Um, <clears throat> you know, I was, um, when I think about form and I think about what a, what a, a poem might look like on the page, obviously, um, you know, I, I, um, I'm familiar with lineated work. Like that's, I think that's my go-to. I love prose poetry, but um, uh, I, I, I think I use that form when I first when I first put something down in a notebook, I just write it in prose. Mm. And I think that also allows me to be more attentive to to the diction because I can I'm not as worried about enjabment or or how a line is going to function on its own or in relation to other lines. But um, um <clears throat> I like lineated forms a lot. And so um one form that I, you know, the sonnet I find uh, or an unrhymed, uh, unmetered sonnet, uh, so essentially just a fourteen line poem, uh, <laughs> is something that I like. Uh, I think it's a, it's a nice little tight form to look at. Um, I also like using couplets. Uh, I use a lot of couplets, but uh, I've I I'm I'm cautious about using couplets. Mm. I was in a bookstore once uh, here in Chicago, and um, I ran into Carl Phillips in 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 this bookstore. <laughs> And so, uh, you know, uh, I introduced myself. I don't think we'd ever met in person. And um, and we were looking through like poetry books together. And, and he he opened one book and he said, this book is all couplets. And I and it just made me think like, oh, you know, what 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 do you mean? You know, and so he said he said, I'm just he, he said something like it just uses too many couplets. And it makes me, you know, makes me think like, does this person actually know what they're doing with couplets? And it made me just like, it just, it just made me rethink the couplet. Like, you know, here's this great poet talking about couplets. And I thought, maybe I don't know enough about couplets mm. uh, to understand what he's getting at. So, um, you know, there, there is a, <clears throat> a technical a way to, 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 to approach any form, including couplets. You know, it, it should, it should be like a line. It should, it should, it should serve its own purpose it should stand on its own it should have its own central idea just like just like a paragraph would or a sentence might um so uh so now i i don't i i try to use couplets sparingly um <laughs> but uh um syllabics are are mm -hmm. something that i absolutely love um you know there is a poem in here that is uh 10 lines and every line is 10 syllables so the entire poem is a hundred syllables. Mm -hmm. um, and there are other poems in here that are um, syllabic as well. And you wouldn't know it unless you just, you just did the counting. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, the poem Oath Keeper is, is the poem I'm talking about. It's, it's 10 lines, 10 syllables per line. Um, and it just looks nice on the page. It's just a nice little like compact uh, uh, structure. But I, I love, I love, um, I love staggering lines, you know, like, like my, um, there's a, there's a poem in here called We Husband and it has so much space. Like it's just, it's just kind of floating across the page. And I, I just, I just love it. I just, I just love having that space in, in this, in particular, this poem is, um, you know, this poem is, is drawing on science, um, and, uh, and thinking about, uh, space uh, at, at an atomic level at a, you know, and, and, and also at a cosmic level. Um, and so the space in this poem seems appropriate. It, it, it just reminds me of, of what I might see if I were looking at um, like an atom, right? Like when you look at an atom in a textbook, you see like all the bits and parts and all the space in between. And mm. it just, it just, it just makes me think of, of what, uh, what that structure might look like. Um, you know, thinking about like elements or dark matter or, or things in space that we can't see. So, so that's, that's what's going on in, in that particular poem. But, um, 
the staggered lines are nice. I, I just, I think there's so much fluidity and movement. Mm -hmm. um, like the poem on communion. Uh, there's, there are long lines, lots of space. Um, and the whole thing is just two sentences long. And it just goes, it goes down the page. You know, there's just like, there's, it's, it's fluid. There's a lot of breath in the space. Like, you know, a lot of white space always reads to me as, as having a lot of room for breath, a lot of room to mm -hmm. breathe. And so, um, so I like that. I like, I like having that um, because it also helps me read it. Like it's easier for me to read when there's more space. Um, um, uh, there's an Ars Poetica in here. You know, that's, mm -hmm. I, I consider that a form. Uh, the poem Genesis is an Ars Poetica, really. I mean, it's it's a poem about, it's a sensual poem. It's a poem about an intimate encounter, but it's really about, um, it's about creation, mm -hmm. uh, poesis. It's about, you know, making poetry, making something. Um, and so in, in this poem, you know, I use um, sewing as a metaphor. Uh, and um, I don't know, can I read it? Yeah, please do. So this is, this is Genesis. Even the province of truth must be stitched. Start with a pattern, a needle and thread to sew the empty sleeves of a sentence, a hole in the hull of a hemistick. We'll begin by weaving a heroic couplet with the tip of our tongues then spit and spin fringe for flare. Thread a loose sentence, darn it. Then slip stitch of subject and predicate through ribbed velveteen. Then set tender Baroque buttons on the cuff and press an adverbial crest over the breast. What is the point? predicated on subject and verb, the smell of your bronzed skin in my mouth, a periodic splinter on the road of my spine along the wall, the collar curls a path to trace the past as the hem unravels. I love that one. That was one of my favorite ones that I kept returning to for the the sounds alongside the images. I think hearing it out loud, that kind of assonance of the A sound, the darn it that then comes back wall a lot. Like we can really feel all of those sounds um, and they're kind of tying all those images together too, which is amazing. Love it. Thank you. And lots of um, shouts in the chat as well. There were a couple more questions in the chat. Um, a question, when do you determine a poem is done? Like, how do you stop tinkering with a poem? Big question. <laughs> That's a tough one. Uh, it's tough because, um, yeah, because, I mean, you can, you can essentially, you know, I mean, language is, uh, you know, it's seemingly there's so many different words you can use to say the same thing, obviously, and, and you can change things again and again, but, um, uh, I just, I, if there's, I, I, I read my poems again and again, um, mostly aloud because as I've mentioned, sound is, is very important. Uh, but I, I want the sound to be present while also ensuring that, what it is I'm trying to illustrate is also present. And um, sometimes, sometimes having, um, sometimes arriving into a poem and kind of and being in the middle of, of whatever situation is, is, is being illustrated, um, you know, is, is, uh, is a great way for me to, to know that, um, So I, I like to begin a situation in a poem and, and by its end, I either want to complicate the situation or I want to um, come away having 
um, having had a moment of reflection or having, uh, having been satisfied by the situation in some way. Um, I feel like I'm being really abstract here, but you know, um, kind of like, uh, you know, I'm thinking about like the poem, I, I was a boy. Um, and it's a poem about, it's a poem about, it's a poem about understanding my sexual identity and understanding um, what it means to be a queer person in the world, uh, not just today, but uh, you know, what, what does it mean to be a queer person in the world today because of what's, what's happened mm -hmm. in the past. And, um, and like this poem, you know, it begins with me thinking about myself as a child and I move through um, these different historical moments that I experienced as a child uh, related to my um, sexual identity. And uh, ultimately, you know, I arrive at, at this kind of, um, I, I, I step outside of myself and just, and look back and think of, of myself uh, having grown up through these experiences. Mm -hmm. And by the end, you know, I, I, I feel like I've come to terms with a particular, with, with a particular moment that I started with, right? The, the poem opens with this line about being uncomfortable about my body. And by the time I get to the end, uh, you know, I kind of, I kind of come around again and think about where I started. So the end of the poem is another comment on the body, but it's mm -hmm. a comment on, uh, it's a more of, of a uh, more, more um, it's a reflective moment about the body having gone through all these different memories. So maybe it's, maybe it's that circular nature, that, that idea that I've started in one place and I, I come back to it by the time I get to the end. And if I haven't come back to it, um, then maybe, maybe it's not, it's not where I want it to be. Mm. I don't know if that, if that helps. It's, it's difficult. Like you said, it's a big question. Yeah. Yeah. And I can imagine too, it can be different for every poem, right? That sort of nebulous space of um, what a completed version of that poem is. Even in time, we might think it's complete at one time and then go back to and be like, actually, I've changed and now I want the poem to change with me. And <laughs> so those are the hardest um, questions to, to answer, um, to pin down a little bit. Um, I'm just going to check time. Okay, we've got a few more minutes. Um, there's a question here that actually I was hoping to ask as well about the title of the collection, Brutal Companion. Um, so I wondered if you could talk where the title came from um, and how you maybe see the collection sort of functioning within the space of that title, that kind of um, extra layer of meaning that the title might give as well. Yeah, the, the title... Um... Brutal Companion was uh, the title that um, it was the second title that I, that I mm -hmm. actually wanted it to be. But the initial title uh, was a um, was kind of an amalgam of two other titles. I, I I'd been reading um, a book by Valgina Mort called um, Music for the Resurrected. I think it might mm -hmm. might have been her last book. Um and I was also in the middle of working on a, a, a presentation about another poet named Paul Monet, who I reference a few mm -hmm. times in the book. Um, and Paul Monet had a book called um, uh, uh, Carpenter for the Asylum. Mm -hmm. um, and so the book, when I when I first put the manuscript together, there was something about those the 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 two titles that really stuck with me. And uh, and so the the title I gave the book initially was Carpenter for the Resurrected, and mm. in my mind I had this idea that I'm I'm resurrecting all these um, not just memories but I'm I'm resurrecting this the grief and the pain that I went through, and as I you know as I kept revising or organizing the book and organizing the poems, um, the title just just didn't really seem to to, to encapsulate what I really wanted to say um, about the kind of the emotional emotional weight of the of the of the mm -hmm. poems and um you know that this the grief and the loss and the pain and all the very 
difficult situations in the book, um, many of which I experienced firsthand, many of which were observations of, of, of people that I knew, friends, lovers, you know, they went through these difficult situations. Um, uh, you know, I, I, I've dated a lot of men who had addiction problems mm -hmm. um, or addiction, who, who had addictions. And um, uh, I dated somebody who was a heroin addict and I was not aware that they were a heroin addict. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I didn't know. Um, uh, I, I spent the night once and uh, the next morning they were, they went to work and I was actually, you know, cleaning up, tidying up. And um and in, in my process of tidying up, I found a syringe and tourniquet, which mm -hmm. is in the book. Uh, mm -hmm. So that like that very moment was was absolutely a real moment. Like I really did find this. And I, you know, I found it. And I was like, oops, uh, I better put that back. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and that was it. And, and um, that was that was actually that was the end of that. Uh, and so, you know, I just got to thinking about all these all the things in the world around us that um, that draw our attention and, and many of them are distractions. And, uh, you know, I, I have been um, guilty of, you know, having a lot different distractions, whether it's, you know, alcohol or um, food, you know, we all have, we all have things that we're addicted to, you know, and I, I, I had a, I had a conversation with a friend, um, when I was finalizing this book about um, about his sobriety, it was a, it was another poet who had gone through through you know uh, a sobriety and um, and I said, how did you do it? And he said that uh, he said, you know, addictions uh, like ad addictions with alcohol or drugs, um, you just he he said something to the extent of um, you just have to find something something to substitute that you have to substitute that with something else. So it's like, mm -hmm. find another addiction that's good for you. And for him, it was like basketball or going to the gym. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I just thought, you know, like we're all addicted to something. Uh, and sometimes it's, it's, sometimes it's something that's not good for us, like drugs or sex or alcohol. Uh, and, um, and it just, it just, it made me sad to, to, to think of all the people that I've, I've, encountered in my life you know I I've had some really interesting experiences mm -hmm. you know I grew up in Hollywood essentially mm -hmm. uh you know I was I was in I was going out and 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 seeing the Hollywood nightlife at the age of 15 and I did that for like a decade mm -hmm. um and so I you know I've seen a lot of wild things um but I still, you know, even even outside of that, even once I left LA and I went to school and just met people in different communities, you know, this these addictions never disappear. Like there's they're always present in in someone's life, and um, you know, it, it, there it's it's a companion. It's something you just mm -hmm. carry with you. And I just got to thinking about how how grief functions in a similar way. It's something that you just you embody it's something that it's it's there with you just like an addiction you can you can certainly walk away and, or put it away but it, it's there it's always mm. there and um and so when i think about like like these these things that like the loss that we carry or the people the memories of people that we have that we carry with us that that may or may not be pleasant you know yeah it's like Yes, thank you, Penelope. It's like a dark passenger. Who said that? I've heard that before. My dark. Oh, um, Dexter. Hmm. Yes. Um, yeah. So, like, brutal companion is like it's something that you can you you always have with you, and you know whether it's an addiction that is good for you or not. Um, it's it's like it is a companion. It's something hmm. that you have with you all the time, and uh, and I think that. Um, the brutal nature of some of those addictions and some of those um, companions uh, are the ones that I think have been most memorable and have impacted me the most. They've allowed me to see the world in 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 and understand the world and people in so many different ways that 
when I started looking back at all these poems, I just, you know, I got to thinking like there's so much joy that a lot of these people or situations um, embodied, but there is also so much darkness. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so this, this kind of this juxtaposition, right? Like this contrast of, of what we expect a companion to be um, is, is ever present, I think, in these poems. Mm -hmm. So, so it just seemed like a really fitting title to think about it that way. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for, it's always nice to hear sort of the evolution of a title and all these different considerations, how a title might bring out different themes within the poems or highlight these kind of threads that then you can trace um, throughout the poems themselves. And um, I think that's a great place for our chat to unfortunately end tonight. We are at time. It just flies by. Um, but I hope that everyone picks up a copy of Brutal Companion. We've put the link back in the chat. Um, Ruben, thank you so much for your generosity and all of these insightful answers. I know this will be a chat that I go back to for my own sort of study purposes. Um, and I hope others do as well. So thank you for everything tonight. And thank you everyone for being here this evening too. Thank you everyone. Thank you so much for having me.